pulpit, we would continue on in Nehemiah. But uh, I got the phone call between 8.30 and 9 o'clock last night that Scott was not feeling well, so he wasn't going to be here. And so I don't normally title my sermons, but if I was going to title this one this morning, it would be called Not Nehemiah. <laughs> so, but let me invite you to uh, Luke chapter 10. Uh, we're going to look there at, a, at one of my favorite uh, passages, favorite stories uh, in the Bible, one that you'll probably be very familiar with, the story of Mary and Martha. I love this story uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because of its simplicity, something that we can easily relate to, but secondly, because of its importance. It's a story that appears nowhere else in any of the gospel record, and so in this sense, it's a unique, a unique portion that fits into the purpose of the historian, Dr. Luke, as he writes the history of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. It occupies an important place in the flow of this gospel, and even more importantly, should occupy an important place in all of our lives, in all of our thinking. The story is found in Luke chapter 10. I'm going to begin reading at verse 38 and read through the end of the chapter. Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 38. It says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Now, as I said, this is a story that's very simple and something that we can easily relate to. As you understand, Jesus and the disciples are continuing on their journey, and this is a journey that's taking them eventually to the city of Jerusalem. That's where they're headed. And they've kind of been crisscrossing their way across Galilee and Samaria on their way to Jerusalem. And as they have been entering the villages, they have been teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as they make their way into this, what is called a certain village, this, and we know from the Gospel of John, that this certain village is the, the village of Bethany because that's the home of Mary and Martha. And as Jesus and the disciples enter into this city, this village, um, it would not be unusual that they would stay with somebody. And as you can imagine, we are, in fact, we've got family here this morning that have come into town. And during the course of the week, uh, as uh, we were preparing, mostly Lynn was preparing for their, for their arrival. She was cleaning and straightening things up and getting things nice and prepared for them to arrive. And as we would all do, right? The holidays are coming up pretty soon. You're going to be having family in. And so you take those extra steps when you've got company coming, especially if you know they're coming. They're not just showing up on your doorstep, but you know they're going to arrive. And so you make those plans. You make those preparations. You get ready for the guests that are going to arrive. And so Mary and Martha have been preparing for the arrival of Jesus and the disciples, and we don't know the specific preparations that are being made. We don't know uh, what kind of cleaning process Mary and Martha had to go through to get the house ready. By the way, we do know that Mary and Martha are the sisters of another guy that's pretty famous. What's his name? Lazarus. That's right. This is the sisters of Lazarus. But at any rate, they're preparing for Jesus and the disciples, and I would imagine that uh, since uh, the, they're going to be showing up at their home, they're probably preparing a meal and uh, whatever has been involved in getting that ready. You know, the table's got to be set. There has to be a, a place settings of uh, uh, flowers perhaps on the, on the table and you know, the, the food's on the stove and the tea has to be made and ice has to be put in the glasses and everything has to be get, gotten ready. Jesus and the disciples show up somewhere in that process of preparation and you can imagine as they get there and they knock on the door and they open the door and Jesus and the disciples come in and find comfortable places to sit around the living room or the den or family room or whatever kind of accommodations Mary and Martha had. And so they come in and Jesus sits down, perhaps in the lazy boy recliner there in the living room, and, and they're talking about the events of the day perhaps, some of the, the things. And just recently the 70 have returned. And so I'm sure they've got some stories to tell. 
And I'm sure Jesus is, as he has been doing, he's been investing his life in these guys. He's been teaching them the scriptures. He's been teaching them the gospel. And so uh, I'm sure there's some teaching that's going on. In fact, we find out that, uh, that Mary, when the disciples and Jesus come in and sit down, then instead of going back to her preparations, Mary just has a seat right there next to Jesus. And she's listening to the conversations that are taking place. She's eager to hear what's coming from the lips of Christ. She wants to hear God's word. And so she's sitting there and she's listening, the story tells us. And Martha, on the other hand, well, she's the one who's the, the older of the sisters. She's the, the, the head of the household. She's the one that's making sure things are happening around there. And so she's busy continuing with the preparations because there are things that have to be done. Napkins to be folded, silverware to be put out, those kinds of things. And Martha's busy doing that, and she begins to look around because everything's coming together all at once. It's time for them to enjoy this, this time together. And she looks around, and she realizes, how come I'm the only one that's doing anything here? She begins to look around for that no-good sister of hers, and she can't find her to give her a hand with the preparations for their guest. And so she pokes her head into the living room, and there's Jesus and the disciples, and there's her Lazy sister Mary sitting there on the floor doing nothing, at least from her perspective. And Martha's a little bit ticked off. She's upset that she's the only one that's doing the work. And so she walks in there and she says, listen, Jesus, would you tell my lazy sister to get up and give me a hand? Because Martha has been concerned about all the preparations that are, that are taking place. And really, there's nothing wrong with what Martha's doing because we're, told, we're taught in the Scriptures very directly. We are to be hospitable. We are to show hospitality to others. It's commanded in the Bible, Romans 12, 13, 1 Peter 4, 10. It's commanded to show kindness to people, and that's what Martha is trying to do. She's trying to be kind. She's trying to be a good host, and there's certainly nothing wrong with entertaining guests. That's good. It's good that, that those things are done, and her devotion is commendable, but but notice here in this story that, that what the, the Luke tells us in verse 40, it says, but Martha was distracted with much serving. What was she distracted from? What was her serving taking her focus away from? Well, she was distracted from hearing the word of the Lord. She was distracted from listening to, to Jesus. And so when she goes to, to Jesus and says, would you tell my sister to get up and give me a hand? Jesus looks at her and says very kindly, but very directly, Martha, you're worried about so much stuff. You think you got a lot of stuff going on. There are really only a few things that are really important. Really, there's just one thing that is most important. And Mary has chosen to do that. And what was Mary doing? She was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to what he had to say. She was taking in the word of God. Have you ever felt like life is just so cotton-picking busy? There is so much going on. You've got relationships to deal with. You've got work issues to deal with. You've just got life to deal with. And we get so distracted and so caught up in things that are not unimportant to us, things that have to be done. But we get so distracted that we lose sight of what is the most important thing. And that's simply being with Jesus, learning from him and from his word. And so Martha goes in there and she's been distracted and because she's gotten her eyes taken off of what's really important, it has messed up everything else for her. It's messed up her attitude, right? I mean, she's, now she's angry. She's been out of shape because her sister's not doing what she thinks her sister ought to be doing. And not only that, but notice this, that she walks into the living room or wherever they happen to be sitting, and she says to the Lord of glory, 
You tell my sister she needs to come in here and give me a hand. She's commanding the Lord of glory to command Mary. That's a little bit twisted, isn't it? That we would give commands to the Lord. And yet, isn't that sometimes the way it gets for us when we lose sight of what his words told us? We want to tell God what to do. Or we want to tell God, you ain't getting this right. You, if, I, if I were God, I would have done it this way. I would have done it differently. And so we get so busy and we get so distracted by so much stuff going on in life. Particularly right now, I mean, there's, there's bizarre stuff going on in our world right now. And I don't just mean our world out there. I mean our personal worlds. Weird stuff is happening to us. And it distracts us from what God says is the most important thing for us to do, which is to spend time with him and his word. And so Martha is getting twisted, and she's getting her attitude all bent out of shape, and she's, uh, she's getting confused and getting angry, and she tells Jesus, she commands Jesus to command Mary to give her a hand. And Jesus says, but Martha, Mary has chosen what's most important. She's chosen to sit here and spend time with me. And there are a couple of reasons I want to share with you why it is so important that you and I make it a priority in our lives that we spend time with Jesus, hearing his word. And when I talk about, when I talk about spending time with Jesus, I'm talking about, obviously, personal quiet times, devotional times, times where you're, you get alone with you and your Bible and God and y'all uh, allow the Lord to teach you through his word. But it's not just that. It's also gathering with the saints to hear the word of God preached. Whenever God gives us opportunity to be taught from his word, we should relish that. We ought to consider that as an important part of our life. It ought to be a priority in our lives to gather with the people of God to hear the word of God preached. Jesus said, hearing from me is the most important thing you can do. Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And there are a couple of reasons for that that I want to share with you. And the first reason is because theology matters. What we believe about God, what we believe about Jesus Christ matters in our lives. Every couple of years, Ligonier Ministries partners with uh, Lifeway Research, and they do what they call the State of Theology Survey. It's an attempt to determine what people believe about tenets of the Christian faith. And they just, this month, September, they, uh, Ligonier Ministries just released the 2020 State of Theology. And uh, there's a, a in, the, in the survey, it's a list of about 35 or 36 statements that are made, and people respond with strongly disagree, strongly agree, or someplace in the middle there. You can, can respond to the statement. But this is what the survey determined in a couple of areas. 52% of adults in the United States believe Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. More than half the country. Now, that doesn't surprise us, does it, at the population at large? So that may not surprise us, but what about this? 30% of evangelical Christians believe the same thing, that Jesus is a great teacher, but he is not God. An evangelical Christian is defined as people who uh, strongly adhere with the following four statements. This is how they define, that's why they determine what they would call an evangelical Christian. You agree with the statement, the Bible is the highest authority for all, for what I believe. It is important for me personally to encourage non-Christians to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Jesus Christ's death on the cross is the only sacrifice that could remove the penalty of my sin. Only those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. So if you could respond positively to all four of those statements, you are considered, by the, according to this survey, an evangelical Christian. But 30% of the people that would identify as being evangelical Christians do not believe that Jesus is God. My friends, that is a serious problem in the church. Theology matters. What we believe 
about God, what we believe about Jesus Christ makes a difference in how we live our lives. Another uh, determination of the survey says that 84% of evangelicals in the United States, again, evangelical defined by those agreeing to those four statements, 84% of evangelicals in the United States agree with the following statement. God counts a person as righteous not because of one's works only. Excuse me. It counts a person as righteous not because of one's works, but, but only because of one's faith in Jesus Christ. Only 84% of evangelical Christians believe that. that. Again, let me say that again. God counts a person as righteous not because of one's works, but only because of one's faith in Jesus Christ. And that's down from 91% just two years ago. So in other words, it's a a decreasing number of people. It went from 91% in 2018 to 84% in 2020, where evangelical Christians would say they believe that uh, God counts a person as righteous, not because of one's works, but only because of one's faith in Jesus Christ. So in other words, there's a significant percentage and growing percentage of people that are that are considered evangelical Christians that do not believe that God counts us righteous only by faith in Christ. Again, that's a serious problem. And so that's what I, I say it is important for us to take advantage of opportunities to hear the word of God preached. We need to know God's word. Because every single one of us, and not just us in here, but every single person out there is a theologian. And maybe not an academic theologian, maybe not somebody who makes their living as a theologian, maybe even not somebody that thinks of themselves as being a theologian, but everybody believes something about God. Everybody has some type of theology. Even people who say, I don't believe there is a God have a belief about God, that he doesn't exist, for example. So everybody has some kind of theology, and theology matters. It determines how we live our lives. And so it is, that's why Jesus, one of the reasons why Jesus says, it is important for us to be exposed to the teaching and preaching of God's word. So we know what the scripture says about God. We know what the scripture says about Jesus Christ. We know what the scripture says about ourselves. And how a sinful people could be made right with a holy God. Theology matters. And that's one of the reasons why it's important that we spend time in the Scripture. On our own as well as in the public preaching and teaching of God's Word. But listen very closely to what I'm about to say here. Your theology can be as straight as a gun barrel. And you can be just as empty. Just having straight theology is not what it's about. It's not what being with Jesus is all about. We want to have good theology. We want to have straight theology. We want to be as straight as a gun barrel in our theology. And we want to grow in our understanding of what the Scripture says about who God is and what He has to say to us. But you can be as straight as a gun barrel and just empty as empty. So when Jesus says it's important that we spend time with him, it's not just to have our theology straight. There's another reason to be with Jesus, hearing his word. And it's a principle that is that is just as certain as gravity. Gravity is pretty certain, right? If we were all to climb up into the top of the building this afternoon and every one of us were to take a running jump off the building, where are we going? To the ground. Every single one of us is going to the ground. Why is that? Because of gravity. It's like the comedian Stephen Wright says, gravity. It's not just a good idea. It's the law. And so we understand that. Gravity is the law of gravity. Every single one of us are, 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 are bound by the law of gravity. Well, here's the principle that is just as true as the law of gravity. Every single one of us is bound to it. And the principle is this, the more 
you spend time with a person, the more you become like that person. The more you spend time with a person, the more you become like that person. That's true, isn't it? Now, it may be easier for some of us than others, or we may have more of a tendency than some of us, but all of us, that's true. That's why when you're parenting your kids and they're growing up, and you don't say, hey, just go out there and hang out with anybody you want to. I don't care. It doesn't make any difference. You're who you are. Don't, I'm not worried about who you hang out with. No, we were all concerned with where our, who our kids hung out with because we knew whoever they were spending time with, they were going to become like them. And so we wanted to caution our kids who they spent time with. We wanted to be careful. We wanted to know the kids that our kids were spending time with. We wanted to know not only the kids, we wanted to know their parents and their families as well because the more you spend time with a person, the more you become like that person. That's true in marriage, isn't it? When you've been married a long time, you become more and more like the person that you're married to. Lynn and I are coming up on 41 years of marriage, and we're more like each other now than ever. Uh, w one can, we can ha share the same thoughts. One can start a sentence, the other can finish us. You, you've known people who have been married so long, they even start to look a little bit alike, right? Because the more you spend time with a person, the more you become like that person. That is an, 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 uh, a, a non, you cannot violate that principle. The more you spend time with a person, the more you become like that person. And the same thing is true in our spending time with Jesus Christ. And isn't that our goal in life? To become like Jesus? We want to become more like Jesus. We want our lives to bring glory to God by us becoming more like Jesus Christ. And so that's why it's so important that you spend time in God's Word individually. That's why it's so important that you spend time under the preaching and teaching of the Word of God with the corporate body of Christ so that we can invest in each other so that we can all become growing more and more like Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's our desire. The book of Philippians says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. What God has begun in us, he will continue to perfect until Jesus comes back. And, and that's the importance of spending time with Christ, so that we become more and more like him. You know, our lives are, are so full of, of, uh, of the unnecessary uh, things that control us, things that can mess up our attitudes, that can whack our way at our relationships. We get frustrated over stuff that doesn't really matter, whether it's politics or stuff that you get yourself involved in in, in the, the work-a-day world or things you get yourself involved in in your community. My friends, what we have to do is to commit our lives to one thing, and that is, as David said in Psalm 27, to see the beauty of of the Lord. Or like Paul said, that he wanted to become more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Or like Mary, who chose the good portion. And actually, it calls for a, a superlative in, here in the Greek, where he says, Mary has chosen literally the best part, literally what is best. Mary has chosen what is best, because man shall not live on bread alone but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We have to be feeding ourselves on God's Word for the sake of having accurate biblical theology, but even more important, for the sake of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. That's what our lives are about. That's what our priority is to be. Nothing is better than hearing the Lord speak. Nothing is more important Nothing compares to that. And when that opportunity is there, we should take advantage of it. Mary did. Mary has chosen the best. And Jesus said, I will not take that away from her. I'm not about to send her into the kitchen when it's a choice of preparing a meal or becoming more like me. I'll not take that away from her. And my friends, Mary, was, she wasn't training to become a preacher. 
Mary was not preparing herself to teach a Bible study. As far as we know, she was never going to be in some official uh, uh, position of, of ministry. But what she was going to know more about her Lord, and therefore she was going to see the beauty of her Lord, and she was going to get to love her Lord and long to be like her Lord, the more she learned from his lips. Nothing is more important than divine truth. It is to be our priority. And the Lord sides with Mary in this situation because this opportunity is too rich and too critical to turn to anything else. What is your priority in life, my friends? And in your life, which is so busy, which is so odd right now for you, and I know it is. Things are weird. I don't know if I, I don't know, every day I have some opportunity to say that. Man, life is weird. And it is. It's a weird time. But we cannot allow that to distract us from the priority of individual time alone with God and corporate time with God to hear from Him that we might have biblical theology and more importantly, that we might become like Jesus. Jesus will not take that away from you. Would you pray with me? Father, we're grateful for your word. Lord, we, we love and relate to the stories of the scripture, the narrative parts, because we see ourselves so readily in passages like this. And we can see times when we're we're so much like Martha, distracted from what's really important by things that seem so urgent to us, that seem to be pressing in on us, demands that come our way that we feel like we must meet. And we allow ourselves to be distracted from those things that are really important. We allow ourselves easily to be distracted from your word and all that your word intends to do in us not just teaching us truth, certainly that, and not less than that, but, Lord, transforming us. And we long that your word would not produce just information in our heads, that it would produce transformation in our lives, that we might become more and more like Jesus. God, help us to have a passion for being with you, learning from you, growing in you help us to be disciplined in our time alone with you individually help us take advantage of the opportunities that you give us to gather together corporately to be fed from your word and god through all of this may jesus christ be praised and may our lives be pleasing to you for we ask it in christ's name amen